Hello, my name is Aiden Plank. I'm the bassist with the Cleveland Jazz Orchestra, and I'm here today to talk to you about creating more interesting bass lines. Everything I'm going to be talking about today um, makes the assumption that you feel confident with just creating bass lines, in particular walking lines. So if that's not true for you, um, you might just take that as a nudge to really work on your general walking. And um, maybe some of this information will um, inspire some of that as well as be helpful with that. <clears throat> so my first piece of advice is don't play the same idea over and over again. Uh, if you like certain popular musics, sometimes the bass line is very repetitive and very predictable. Uh, with jazz, however, we try not to be predictable. We try to be um, surprising and discover the unknown. So my first piece of advice is, if you find yourself playing the same thing, willfully tell yourself, next time around, I'm not going to play that. So an example I'll give you is, um, it's so common for me when I play a blues that I start it this way. Now, that's a great line. But if I find myself playing it the first chorus, the second chorus, the third chorus, then I, f I find I don't like that so much. And uh, so I would just try to do something different. So, for example, I might do... There's all kinds of possibilities. So if you find yourself playing the same thing over and over again, just tell yourself next time around, I'm not going to play that. Um, so that's the first piece of advice I have for you. Don't be predictable. The second piece of advice I have for you is to develop a good understanding of the entire range of your instrument. Um, basses are usually the bottom voice of any ensemble. So that's an important thing that we do. Um, but basses can also play high notes. And uh, there's just so many possibilities with the instrument that we neglect if we are only staying back here. Uh, a bit of historical information for you. Older bassists in the 1950s and 1960s used to call this the money zone. Uh, this is half position and first position on the double bass. Uh, that's because when you played and did recordings and things like that, so much of what you did was just in these positions. And if you listen to those recordings, you'll often hear the bass is just hovering right around this zone. So they used to say it's inexcusable to play out of tune in the money zone. Um, but um, now we all play all over the instrument and it's fun and it really helps. So I would recommend not only playing one octave scales. You're working on stolen moments, so that's uh, the blowing section of that is a C minor blues. So I'm saying maybe work on C Dorian. But don't just play that first octave, go up for the second octave, so. So just being able to play more of the instrument, the full range of the instrument, gives you so many more possibilities uh, to interact with, to be melodic with, um, and to be more interesting. So for example, I'll walk one chorus of a C minor blues back here, and then I'll play the next one traveling up the instrument. So, one, two, one, two,
So that gives me a lot more opportunity to create variation and in interest. So use the full range of your instrument. The next piece of advice, and I was doing a little bit of this in my example of walking earlier, is to think more melodically about walking. Uh, walking, as, I'm, as I said earlier, it shouldn't be predictable. Nothing in jazz should be all that predictable. So I don't necessarily want to think of a pattern just to play for my walking. to think more in a in a linear fashion creating a melody so <clears throat> one piece of advice I have for you to be more melodic in your walking is to not be restricted by hitting the root of each chord on the first beat on the downbeat of each measure so when you're learning how to walk that's usually the instruction we give to connect to the root of of each chord on one. Um, but I'm suggesting that if you hear a melodic idea and going to that root, going to one interrupts that idea, it's okay to follow through with the idea and get to the root a little bit later. So for example, um, I'll walk a C minor blues. I'll do it once. I'll do the first four bars of a C minor blues connecting roots. The second um, for then I'll do it the second time, I'll do the first four bars, and I won't always connect to, to the roots on one. So here's example one. So that, I always play the root on one, C minor 7, F minor 7, C minor 7, C minor 7. <clears throat> this time I'm not going to do that. Sometimes I'll do it, but sometimes I won't. So here we go. So if I have an idea, I don't have to just play one. That was just a very melodic idea, rarely playing any root, aside from the first uh, downbeat on measure one. So um, that can help create a little bit more variation in your walking line, and I give the walking line a much more melodic feel to it. I will give a bit of caution that if you take this approach and you are not particularly good at connecting to the root on one of each chord, your walking line can get a little bit um, lost and it might be actually very confusing to your soloist. So this is something to develop over time um, and it's something not to, um, as we say, put the, put the cart in front of the horse. You know, you really do want to be very good and sound at connecting root to root uh, before you take these melodic liberties but they're a really good thing to do. And I'll give one exception. I often tell even very young uh, jazz bass students that when you have the same chord extended over two measures, sometimes it's very helpful just not to play on the second measure the root of the chord. So for example, if I have like in the third and fourth bar, if I have two bars of C minor seven, if I connect root to root, I have fairly limited options. So I'm going right back to C, um, but I'll do it this time, and I'll go all the way through to the four chord, um, and I won't connect to the root on the next, on the fourth bar, so. I think that was right. Let me try it one more time. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's hard to walk a blues in the abstract. Um, anyways. Uh, so being more melodic helps uh, quite a lot. Okay, the next thing I do that I find really gives a ton of energy and excitement to any tune is I utilize pedal points. Um, a pedal point means the chord still exists, but what I'm doing is putting another bass note under that chord. So it kind of creates a new harmonic situation. Um, 
there are tones I can select that are very easy to accept harmonically. Uh, there are other tones I might pick that might be a little bit more controversial <laughs> harmonically. I won't go into those for this, but what I, what I will do is introduce just a fairly diatonic um, process for figuring out how to do this. Um, commonly a pedal point is usually uh, the fifth of that chord. So for example, if the chord is C minor, C minor seven, um, I might choose to play, not even walk, but just do a kind of broken two feel. Over that chord. And what that creates is the sound isn't necessarily from re referencing from C, but now, now from G. So it kind of gives it the chord a different quality, and I don't need to tell my piano player I'm going to do that, or my guitarist I'm going to do that, or the horn player that I'm going to do that. Um, it's very diatonic. It works with the chord. Um, and what it usually does is give a little lift. And I find when I play with good drummers, if I do that, they really open up and do really exciting things. Um, that's another piece of advice I have. I didn't list it on the handout, but uh, if you want the drummer to open up, going down low, playing really kind of energetically, aggressively in this lower range uh, makes them often feel like they can open up. So that's a good thing to do. Um, but another pedal I could do over that C, C minor chord is like D. So I'm pedaling the D and trying to solo over it so you can hear what it would sound like if my soloist was still thinking C minor. But if you're hearing it from this, so if you're a if you're a music geek, that's really um, a, f a sound we call Phrygian. So you can do things like that. That that kind of opens up the tune a little bit. Actually, it opens up a lot. I will give you the warning though, if your ensemble is really thinking dang dang da dang dang da dang dang da dang, a more informed, proper response might be to just walk. So that's uh, another little bit of warning I'll give you there. Um, the last two pieces of advice I have for you. The first is you can think about your line as going with the soloist. If the soloist goes up, maybe your walking goes up. If the soloist goes down, maybe your walking goes down. The other way to think about it is you can do something I call antagonizing. You can antagonize the soloist by uh, if they're going in a way that feels predictable to you, you cannot choose the predictable response and you can suggest something else. So one way to put that is if they go up, you go down. If they go left, you go right. That kind of thing. Um, so, you know, if my soloist is melodically moving up, maybe in my walking, I'm going to start heading down. as a way to kind of give contrast to what they're doing. Um, and the last piece of advice I have for you is really the best piece of advice. And that is to simply copy ideas from bassists you love and feel free to play them when you are playing. I remember when I was like 12, I learned a, a walking um, line by Ron Carter that accompanied a Abersold play along. And I remember still to this day, he did this really interesting thing right at the top of an F blues. He went. And for some reason, that stuck with me all these years. I like that. And so when I'm walking, occasionally I do that. I might even do that over stolen moments.
I also add variations too. So there's all kinds of things you can do. So I hope this is helpful to you. Um, good luck with everything and have a lot of fun. Bye.